Well, back in the 1750s, after uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau became upset, he became upset with uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 1750s was, was the, he was the Jordan Peterson of the 1750s. <clears throat> he, uh, he was the one that became like super upset and super critical of all the radical, the radical atheists that were in the salons of Paris. And so he was kind of expressing his frustration and he was about to enter into a little writing competition on the arts and sciences. And Diderot, one of his friends, kind of as a joke, <clears throat> said to him, Rousseau also had this uh, uh, part of his temperament. See, he became very, he was always, uh, he was very obsessive. And he'd meet somebody and become obsessed with that person and his ideas. And at this particular moment in his life, I don't think he fully realized that Diderot was an atheist. And he was super obsessed with Diderot, like how smart Diderot was and... So he was talking about this essay contest. And Diderot, kind of as a joke, said to him, well, if you're going to enter this contest to win, you got to say something that nobody else would be willing to say. Like, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. <clears throat> and Rousseau used this idea to write an essay, which essentially became like a, like a, model, of, of, uh, a model of acquiring natural holiness. The idea being that, well, civilization is bad, man has to become free, freedom is natural holiness. And of course, the way we become free, the way we become natural, is we, we leave civilization and we go back to nature. And we leave technology and we go back to nature because technology is a form of civilization which, which enchains us. <clears throat> and because Rousseau was kind of a Jordan Peterson of the time, a lot of Catholics, and because he was critical of like the radical atheists, a lot of Catholics started following Rousseau. And he became like a, like a little bit, for a time, he became a little bit of a Catholic hero. <clears throat> and it's actually only a century or so later that, that some Catholics began saying, well, you know, maybe these ideas are not so great. <laughs> maybe, maybe the idea, maybe there is something about obviously critiquing atheism. We shouldn't, we shouldn't follow Spinoza or Locke, right? We're not just a series of perceptions and emotions. But maybe our real goal is to take seriously what our Lord is teaching us in the gospel, to become holy, to become saints. That Christ, <clears throat> Christ is putting before us not the standard of, he doesn't want us just to become the natural man, the primitive man. He wants us to become saints. He's created the church, which is holy, because the church is the mystical body of Christ. And because Christ is holy, his church is holy. And the church deals in one thing, ultimately. Right? The church deals in grace, which produces holiness. <clears throat> so the goal, is to not, the, the goal is not to throw off civilization, to return to nature. That's not, what our, that's not how our Lord describes it. Our Lord does say, and now if we could turn to our Lord, our Lord in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, which for those who have the good fortune of going to daily Mass, you've been, you've been hearing the Gospel of Matthew for the last week or so, and you'll be hearing it for the next several weeks, but we're in this part of the Gospel of Matthew during these weeks where our Lord is laying out the high ideals of holiness for those who are members, for those who are citizens in his kingdom. He's laying out the seeds, the seeds that we want to plant in our souls and to water them with the waters of grace that come through the sacraments and that come through our ascetical struggle to grow as children of God 
to, to acquire both the natural and the supernatural virtues. So as to produce abundant fruit in, our, in, the, in the garden of our soul. And also, so as to spread the kingdom of Christ. <clears throat> our Lord is laying out the qualities of holiness which will define his church and which, which, should, which we should struggle to acquire. And also, that are the standards of building up a civilization. Not a civilization where everyone is in chains, but a civilization where everyone sees the value of living as a child of God and throws off the chains of sin so as to live as a child of God. And so our Lord will tell his apostles, and at this point it's not just his apostles, but it's, it's a huge crowd that's listening to him. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes, where thieves do not break in and steal. <clears throat> Our Lord is calling us to be holy guardians. The, 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 the command that God gives to Adam before the fall is to guard. It's the same, it's in Greek, it's the same word that Plato uses to describe the education of those who will guard the city. Fulax. Fulakain. Our Lord, and in order to be guardians, well, we can't be attached. We can't be attached to earthly treasures. Because if we're attached to earthly treasures, we'll guard those rather than guarding the virtues in our, in our soul. And of course, <clears throat> I mean, not that we want to pick on Rousseau, but, well, but there's, something that, there's, something about, there's something about a kind of mentality that, that, he, that he embodies and that actually starts to become part of the culture. Uh, which I think is important for us to understand as we set out to acquire this holiness that the church has to offer us because the church is holy. And <clears throat> Rousseau also had this idea of, like, well, first of all, the whole purpose of education is to become a natural man, right? And to become a natural man, you've got to put yourself... <clears throat> under the control or under the influence of the perfect natural man. And you've got to let him, in some sense, dominate over you. And one thing you look for in society is you don't really struggle to grow in virtue. I mean, Rousseau, had, he started to get this conception of, well, we should imitate the Romans and the Spartans. Right? We should be tough like them. But it wasn't, it wasn't acquiring habits or disposition to do the good. which is what virtue is. It was, more, <clears throat> it was more to become part of a process, right? To, to find moments where your deepest inner feelings can come out. And Rousseau came up with that, this idea of the happening, right? That we should, we should be looking for, according to Rousseau, we should be looking for moments <clears throat> where we can gather together now, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be on a day-to-day -day basis like challenging ourselves to, to acquire virtues, to achieve specific objectives. Because, well, also, it's, it's part of the complication of the 18th century is that everyone, you read, everyone was kind of eschewing this whole thing of growing in virtue for other, for either English empiricism or Rousseauian romanticism, let's say, 
right? But, but for Rousseau, the idea was to, you had to kind of figure out ways to discover your deepest, inmost feelings. <clears throat> and one way you would discover those is that what, what he called the happening. Right? So as you're going about living your ordinary life, you're not really interested in growing in virtue, challenging yourself to become a child of God and to live as a child of God. Instead, what you're doing is you're kind of going with the flow and you're looking around, you're waiting for the moment where you can participate in a happening. And a happening could be any, like a gathering of people, a gathering of a thousand people. Like a, I guess now we would call that a concert, <clears throat> right? And in that happening, you all share the same deep feeling. And that's what gives you meaning in life. But you haven't grown. You haven't challenged yourself in some way. You haven't let God challenge you. You haven't part- It's almost like it becomes a replacement for the sacraments. The sacraments where you acquire, right? Where God gives you grace so that you can walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> as, this, as, this, as this idea of the happening matured, kind of in the later on, there was a whole, there was even a term that was developed in French called the flaneur, right? Well, what is the flaneur? The flaneur is someone's profession who makes of his profession walking around the streets waiting for an event that's like the happening so he can participate in it and discover his inmost feelings that he shares with everybody else. And I, I bring this up and describe it a little bit because, well, sometimes this is what our life can become. Rather, it can become, rather than the hunt, rather than a hunt to discover the virtues and discover the, the, the vices in our soul and how to root them out and how to acquire the virtues so that we can mature as children of God, become holy, become saints, Sometimes we can fall into, well, being like a flaneur, <clears throat> being someone who, who doesn't challenge himself in any way. And Lord, we're sorry for those moments because, of course, this is a time of prayer. Lord, we want to speak with you. And we're sorry for those moments in our life because we know it's so easy sometimes just to fall into, well, I just, I just go with the flow. Or we just, we let events control us. We have to go here, we have to go there. And we're just waiting. Maybe we're not, maybe when we describe it in terms of Rousseau, we're not, we don't, you know, we, we, we can laugh at it a little bit. But Lord, I think sometimes we have to admit that this is how we are. We don't, there was another moralist, I suppose, you know, if, if, you, can, if you can use the term moralist at the time. He followed John Locke and he said, well, basically, the only real morality is is not following any religious ideals. It's basically just like being a scientist and then realizing that all we are is a bunch of sense perceptions of pleasures and pains. And we have to discover the rules that discipline our pleasures and pains so that we can come up with the right scientific discoveries. And then we're, and that's like, that's like scientific holiness, right? There's no conception of virtue, though. Morality is just conditioning pleasures and pains. I suppose there's a basic something there. But, Lord, sometimes it seems like we, that's what we become. We become one of, these, one of these corrupt notions of the human person, there's still an, the interesting thing, Lord, is that there's still an ideal there. <clears throat> Everyone is still searching for an ideal. The means, when we hear them, they're not too attractive. And that's why, Lord, we ask you that we can see more clearly the great good that you've given us, the wonderful seeds that you have already planted in our souls through the sacraments. But there are seeds that can mature into real holiness 
if we cooperate with you, if we work with you, so as to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. <clears throat> Another way our Lord puts it, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is not sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. Lord, it seems that part of the idea here is that <clears throat> you want us to become bright. You want us to become brilliant. You want us to shine. One of the true features of beauty is brilliance, is the glow of a, show, of a, of a soul that is holy. When, Lord, when we're looking for a wife, <clears throat> what should we look for more than anything else? We should look for a woman who is, who fits the description that we can all, you can read all about it in Proverbs 31, right? The woman who is the mulier fortis. Who is the mulier fortis? It's the woman of virtue. It's the woman who, in her own soul, has cultivated the virtues. If you want, to live, if you want a happy marriage, find a woman whose soul shines, whose soul is brilliant, who has, it has a brilliance because of the virtues. Everything else is secondary to that. And of course, how do you attract someone like that? Acquire the virtues yourself. <laughs> Become holy yourself. Start now. <clears throat> the Catechism of the Catholic Church reminds us that one of the marks of the church is holiness. And Lord, what we ask for is real faith. Real faith that we, in coming, the, 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 in coming to the, the, the font of holiness, and there, there's two ways in which the church, you might say, helps her children to grow in holiness. One way is through the sacraments. The sacraments are indispensable means to grow in holiness, which is why if you come here, we're going to ask you at some point, or someone's going to ask you, hopefully, if the people here know what they're doing, <clears throat> right? Someone will ask you at some point, do you go to daily mass? Or, or we'll challenge you at some point. Do you go to daily mass? Do you go to confession on a regular basis? Why? Because these are the sacraments. <clears throat> Confession, what, habitual confession is the sacrament. That yes, it forgives mortal sins, but it's also the sacrament we go to for personal training. Training in virtue, to acquire grace in our struggle for virtue. <clears throat> and this is why it's not, being, it's not being scrupulous, if we understand it properly, to go to confession on a regular basis if we're really challenging ourselves to grow in virtue, we go because, Lord, we want the grace to grow in virtue. Because we want the grace to acquire whatever virtue it might be that we've, we've spoken about with a mentor or someone who maybe can help us along the way. We want to go to daily mass because, well, we want to receive you because when we, when we receive you at daily mass, we become you. You who are the standard of the virtues. <clears throat> and so the church is holy because the church gives us the sacraments. And the church is also holy because the more we participate in the sacraments, 
the more we become members of the mystical body of Christ, which is holy, because it's the mystical body of Christ. The church also is a font of holiness because the church gives us the means of holiness, which is prayer and the ascetical struggle. <clears throat> St. Josemaria has a little phrase that he uses in one of his homilies, how to grow in virtue. I mean, the, the phrase, he's thinking about how do you grow in virtue? And he says one of the best ways to grow in virtue is to take the Gospels, as we do here in the prayer, this, this time of prayer, in which, Lord, we are before you. But one of the best ways to grow in virtue is to take the prayer. And he, it's a little phrase that he uses, but it's very interesting for us. Take the Gospels and engage what he says in active, silent contemplation. Because when we engage in active, silent contemplation of the Gospels, or active, silent contemplation of God, it requires a lot of work to do this. It requires a certain effort. But at the same time, it's the highest thing we can do as men. And our Lord rewards this by giving us deep insights into his nature, into our nature. <clears throat> we don't, we're not going to discover our nature by, 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 by going to a happening, <laughs> whatever is the modern-day equivalent of the happening. We're not going to discover our nature by throwing off the chains of civilization. and running off into the countryside, and rejecting innovation and technology. We're going to discover our nature by active, silent prayer, by active, silent contemplation. And it's important to do this on a regular basis. <clears throat> it's true that the church is made of sinners who are imperfect. The reason the church is holy is that the church is the body of Christ. It is the mystical body of Christ. The church is also holy because it can take people who are imperfect sinners and it can transform them into saints. And then in turn, these saints can go out into society and draw other sinners in who can convert, who can be purified, who can make acts of reparation, who can be renewed. Because the church has an inexhaustible source. The church has a treasure, an inexhaustible treasure that, that can be used Another way of saying it, the church has an inexhaustible reservoir of medicine that can be used to heal any wound. And not only that, it has an inexhaustible reservoir of nutrients and vitamins right, that can produce abundant fruit in our souls. <clears throat> and these, these people that come, those who come to the church and truly engage in this struggle to become holy, they can produce holiness in the lives of others, and they can also transform, reshape society according to the model of Jesus Christ. The saints have always been, and they always will be, the source of renewal in society. They will be the ones who can help, uh, help society move through difficult moments. They are the ones who can recall society to the common good, to the true common good, which can only be understood in the light of God. And that's our mission, right? Our mission is to become holy, as our Lord would tell us, because I am holy. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> 
And <clears throat> as we're getting closer to the feast day on June 26 of St. Jose Maria, perhaps it could be good for us, well, just to thank our Lord. To thank our Lord for the message that he gave to St. Jose Maria. And, and I think also to, to go to St. Jose Maria. Right, to go to him as our intercessor for becoming saints in our circumstances. The particular message that God gave to St. Jose Maria, it's not a new message, but he gave it to St. Jose Maria in a, in a, with kind of a new emphasis. <clears throat> and he also helped St. Jose Maria to start an institution so that this message could be lived. And the message that our Lord gave to St. Jose Maria is that, well, the way that men and women can become holy is through their ordinary lives, through their work, through their family commitment. And ordinary does not mean, ordinary does not mean a life of compromise. Ordinary does not mean a life of going along with what's the mode, what's the fashion of the moment. Ordinary does not mean saying or doing what gets me into polite company or the right social clubs. <clears throat> ordinary means the ordinary, that, that my circumstances, wherever God has placed me, those are the circumstances where God wants me to be an authentic saint. Those are the circumstances where God, where I can live the high ideals of holiness and lead others to come to see those ideals, introduce them to those ideals. And St. Jose Maria, once he saw this message in 1928, he dedicated his life to forming an institution well, that would provide the classes, the structure, the formation, the education, <clears throat> not the education that Rousseau dreamt of <laughs> so that people could become natural men, but instead the education or the formation that would make them Real men, right? Real children of God who are holy because God is holy and who are spreading this ideal and transforming society because they have the strength of God and the grace of God behind them. And so in these days, we can take the prayer card to St. Jose Maria and we can pray it, asking him, Asking him to, to obtain for us, right, whatever it is that we need so that we can really finally take seriously the struggle to become saints using all the means that God in his goodness has left us to, well, to be committed to this struggle. And let's also turn to Mary, our mother, and let's ask Mary, who is queen of all saints, let's ask her also to help us, to obtain for us this grace, the grace that we can truly be committed to the struggle to grow in holiness because her son is holy, her church is holy, and to have this faith and confidence that if we are committed to the struggle, the church will lead us to her son. <clears throat> 